Good evening, and welcome to the TNT show, The Nation Talks. It's the show that everyone's talking about, and we're so glad that you joined us this evening. As you know, we have an audience that extends right across the world. So a big welcome, particularly to the folks in New Zealand and Australia and elsewhere who are with us this evening. You know, it's been another great day for British democracy. Uh, we are learned, for example, today that uh, Boris Johnson has uh, decided that July 19 is going to be Freedom Day. Now, many of you watching and listening might think, gracious, it's Independence Day. He's, he's agreed to a Section 30. No, no, it's freedom for the virus. The virus will become free, apparently, on, uh, on, uh, on, on, the, on the July 19. Uh, <clears throat> in Scotland, of course, it's very different. And uh, the advice, anyway, from all the medical experts, or certainly most of them, is you really need to keep wearing your mask. Really keep wearing your mask. It's the way you protect yourself, but also the way you protect other people. So that's our, our TNT health advice for this evening. Uh, and I hope you find that useful. Uh, tonight is a special uh, pleasure for me because we'll be welcoming Ian Leckenby. Who is Ian Leckenby? Well, those of you who are active in the Yes Movement will know Ian pretty well, I suspect. But for those of you who don't, he'll be talking about his life and his success as a Scottish activist for independence. And his story is well worth listening to, I guarantee you. So if you have questions for Ian or for any of us on the TNT show, uh, go to the What's On Guide and you can leave your question there and we'll try and answer as many as we possibly can tonight. Again, thank you for joining us. TNT stands, of course, for The Nation Talks. And tonight, the nation is talking to Ian Leckenby. Tell me, Ian, how are you coping with the pandemic? With difficulty. I mean, it's been a really strange 18 months that we've all had to live through. It's, uh, you talk about things that we've all got in common, and this is something that the globe has got in common. What's happened with the COVID, it's affected our day-to-day -day lives. Um, so yeah, it's just a case So hopefully we're seeing some light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I've had my first jab of the vaccine. I know lots of people watching will have had their, their vaccinations through. Um, and although we're seeing infections going up, but this is one of the things I think that's, that's quite important about this vaccination programme is it doesn't stop you getting uh, COVID-19. It doesn't stop you being infectious with it, which is why it's important to continue our social distancing, washing hands, wearing face coverings and enclosed public spaces. But what it does do is it's having a massive effect on the number of hospitalizations. Um, you know, the COVID numbers are going up day by day still, which is to only be expected with, you know, things with the social hospitality industries reopening, people gathering that bit more. Uh, but it is good to see that the deaths aren't reflected in that, like we've seen on the, the first and the second peak. So, but yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to some sort of normality. Uh, looking forward to you know getting out and about again. Um, I know there's some independence events coming up in the next few weeks, and as someone that you know, one of the things that I've you know infamous for being doing within the indie movement is going out to the, the marches and rallies and any event I can to put out a live stream to to get out there to a wider audience. Um, I've certainly missed doing that. I know people have missed seeing that. So yeah, it's um, hopefully we've got some light at the end of the tunnel and we can all move on with our lives in a free and independent Scotland. Well, that would be good, wouldn't it? I mean, it, it's interesting too, you talked about getting out there and engaging with people and then communicating what you're doing to a, a larger audience. I mean, it all seems very laudable. And in fact, it seems to fit rather well with the whole concept of the mass media being focused elsewhere because their uh, oversight lies elsewhere. I mean, the BBC, for example, is perhaps the only broadcaster uh, that I can think of that, that has no local democratic oversight of its conduct. So effectively, it can behave pretty much as it likes without any fear uh, that its uh, uh, viewers and listeners or audience are upset because it doesn't report to them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think a perfect example of that is looking at shows like Question Time. You know, where you see that the, there's a pre-selected audience, there's um, the same faces coming up. It's uh, wives of Tory councillors, it's uh, knowing unionist activists. It's all these different 
mind games that the BBC play. And it's, it's, some people always stay on streams as well. Is you won't see this in the BBC, you know, because they don't cover the independence events. They don't cover the, the stories. They don't have anything to do with it. What they'll simply do is challenge the, the Scottish government on everything that they're doing, the way they're conducting themselves. Um, mm, and it's... Really? it's that, that, that's probably healthy. I mean, that, that part of it, I really don't uh, seriously object to because I think it's, it's healthy that politicians are held to account. But I also feel that broadcasters can't somehow subtract themselves from that same uh, criteria. I mean, if criteria, for example, uh, if politicians are held to account, why isn't the broadcaster held to account? Why doesn't the broadcaster have to, for example, go to the Scottish Parliament for funding? Why doesn't the broadcaster have to go to the Scottish Parliament and explain their behaviour over a period of time? After all, they're taking uh, money from Scottish consumers and under normal circumstances, those consumers would exercise a degree of control over the output. In other words, if I go along and decide that my local supermarket is selling the wrong baked beans, then I don't buy the blank beans, <laughs> I just don't. And they go and change that. But if, for example, you and I and many others objected to the BBC's output, it could carry on regardless. I mean, to be honest with you, I, I don't object to their output, I just don't pay attention to it anymore. Um, and it's, it kind of reminds me, one of, one of the times I was we were up at the one of the SNP conferences, um, and I was sitting in a room with uh, an Airbnb that they'd been rented out and uh, six o'clock news came on and I'm chatting away. It's like, no, oh, sh- we've got to hear what's on the news, we've got to hear what's going to say about comfort. Like, you're listening to the enemy. You're listening to the ones that we're saying to people to constantly turn off from. Because it is, it's, it's paid propaganda. Um, and especially the now, you know, following the news recently, they're talking about taking uh, some of the decision making from BBC Scotland back down to London. Um, and that's going to cost jobs up here. It's going to cost people their livelihoods. Um, but then it could create a space for Scotland to create its own media stations. You know, we've, we've got ourselves here at Independence Live. We've got Broadcast in Scotland. We've got Caledon Radios. You know, we've got all these brilliant independence-based uh, news outlets, information providers. But it's trying to get that into the mainstream, trying to get that into the... You know, because not everyone's on Facebook, not everyone's on YouTube, not everyone's, you know, following what's going on in the social media world. So what we need to try and work out as a movement is how do we reach those that we're not getting to at the moment? Um, and that's where the marches, the rallies, the, the Yes Bridges, the Yes Stoners, all these different groups and people carrying out their activities and reaching out to different communities are... are and, I mean, it's one of the things, we'll obviously talk about the walk throughout the, the show, but one of the things that I found specific about doing the long walk to freedom was when we were going through the rural communities, people were delighted to see us. You know, they, they, it was someone coming there to speak, to actually hear what was their opinion. Um, you don't get that in the, the, the main population. You don't get that in the central belt because we're all in our own wee bubbles. And these people are out in the rural communities, like it's a Huntley and... Uh, first so and all over the shop they just they were amazed that something was happening as it was passing through their area so it's it's about trying to create a program where we get into the the mindsets of everybody yeah yeah i mean it's it is it is fascinating i mean i i i, it, it, I mean in many ways you're right indie live does a great job and so do so do many of the other outlets i mean the little bit that i do is to i always give a plug as I did for Europeans at the end of my Sunday National column. Uh, but it's at the back of the paper, and uh, I, I'm not convinced that it's everyone's immediate, uh, fills an immediate appetite for readers, for readership. But it, nonetheless, it's there, and it's a connection between the national and, and what's happening on TNT. But I agree with you, this whole thing needs to be uh, much broader based. But uh, I'm heartened by the fact that the work that you're doing and the work that Kevin Gibney and others is doing, it's, it's raising the professional standards. And once you get to a point, it seems to me anyway, that the professional standards uh, behind the programming that, that underpin the programming become so good that, frankly, people just don't pay a license fee anymore because they say, look, if I need material that's not 
uh, focused away from what I think is important, uh, then there's a place I can go to. And for example, everything on Indie Live pretty much, I assume, certainly applies to the TNT show, is available on YouTube. You know, we've done almost 60 shows now. It's all, all available there. Uh, and we interview people right across the board. Which uh, I think is. Let's take some questions, if you don't mind. Normally we reserve this for later, but we've got so many coming in that it would be ludicrous to put it off. Here we go. Uh, Angela Leach is asking, uh, how do we get the campaign started? It's a difficult one. I mean, I feel like the, for me personally, I was working abroad over in Austria uh, when I seen Nicola Sturgeon delivering the first section 30 request. I think it was, what, March 2017. So for me, that was the start of the campaign. I knew when I was getting back to Scotland, that's what I was going to be working on. And that's how I got involved with doing the live streams and the, the different shows and everything else that I've done within the, the, the indie cause. Um, but it is, but we're, we're all working on these wee different projects. You've got AUOB, who have been phenomenal in the, the, the numbers that they've managed to generate over the, the, the last couple of years pre COVID. You know, yeah. we had what, nearly 180,000 in Edinburgh, um, over 100,000, 140,000, I think, one of the times in Glasgow, and 90,000 in the middle of, uh, what was it, January when we had a weather warning? You know, the rain was coming down. <laughs> You've never seen before. And the people are still out dancing to the drums under the bridges in Glasgow. It was so. Yeah, we, we, we are motivated, and and all those. It's, if you've ever been to any of these indie marches, you'll know the atmosphere is phenomenal. You know, one of the things that the the councils are always very heavy on is having the right number of stewards and police there, and it's we, we police ourselves. You know, we we clean up the parks afterwards. We make sure that there's no one, no man's left behind. You know, there's, there's, there's never any grief. There's, I've, I've never seen a single arrest from a yesterday at any of these events. So it's keeping that positive message going. Um, but really, I wish we didn't rely on politicians, but it's going to have to be the political aspect of the the Scottish government that activates the independence gun, and that has to be the SNP and. It's down to SNP members, if they can, to lobby their, their, their MSPs, their MPs, their local groups to get active and to get some sort of something down. Because it's now that the election's done and the SNP have their kind of minority government without any other pro indie parties holding them to account. Um, yeah, I, you know, how long's going to be in the back burner? Nicola Sturgeon talks about the the COVID recovery has to take place first. It's like, well, we can't have a COVID recovery until we have an independent Scotland. We've seen it with what's happened in Westminster with the handing out of PPE contracts to Tory donor pals. And, you know, how much have they spent on the track and trace programme? 37 billion. And, you know, they can't, you know, they're losing contacts. They can't, it's just, it's been an absolute farce how things have been managed in, the account, they're still massively up in the polls. And it's like, how are people not seeing this? How can you allow a government to have so much control over your lives and not hold them to account? Exactly. So, yeah, exactly. it's... it's so what, what, again, how do we get the campaign started? It's, it's going to be just down to individuals getting out there. And as I said, as we start to come out of lockdowns and all these social distancing measures are lifted, we can have our gatherings again. Uh, and safe and well manners, then that will just get the message out and about. Yeah, I think that's important. Uh, one of the other questions we've been asked is this. <coughs> uh, sorry, I'm having trouble with my system here. It's running out, that's better. Uh, Stephen Kelly is asking this question. This is a particular question about Lanarkshire. He says, why has the Indian movement never had a rally in Lanarkshire? Well, we 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 done the long walk to freedom. I know Stephen very well. Um, Stephen's one of these. Um, I hope he won't mind me saying this. He's, he's, he doesn't like going out into got crowds. He's, he struggles with being in public environments like that. So he's one of the yes individuals that will vote yes independence. But he won't see him a march. But what he will do is he'll be active on social media about it. He'll be on every single stream as he is today. Um, but yeah, the, the all walked freedom. We, we walked through Motherwell. Um, we went past his gaff, 
uh, took it through East Cobride, went through all North and South Lanarkshire. So there is events that happen. It's just a case of where are they happening? Um, and that's down to local yes groups. I, I think one of the, the best resources that I've found recently has been the National Yes Registry, um, which you can find online, nationalyesregistry.scot. Um, and it's got all the groups across the, the whole country. You know, So you can look into your local area, what yes communities are there, what yes activities will be taking place. And it's just a case of networking and, and getting everyone on the same hymn sheet. And that's, I think that's where the politicians let us down. Um, so I don't think they communicate enough with the grassroots yes movement. I don't think they take enough time a day. Um, I know individuals that put on rallies that will have problems if they've got one person speaking from one political party, this person won't come from this political party and vice versa. And it's, it's, we're going to have, you know, one of the things that kind of annoys me about the independence movement is I don't see enough talk about what will independence be, what is going to happen in an independent Scotland, what kind of future do we see for our country? Um, it's all just about getting the done. I think we need to have a, you know, if we're going to convince people that are leaning towards staying in the United Kingdom, we're going to have to have solid arguments about what vision you have for the country. So. I'd like to see a lot more conversations around that. You know, what happens to our, our armed forces? What do we do on global community um, cooperations with different governments? What's going to be our international policies? All these different factors that, that just don't seem to be coming out yet. Because and I'm not going to hear say and slander the SNP because they have done a phenomenal job in government. But I think that's a priority. I think the priority is running the, the 20% of Scotland that they currently control. Um, I think you're right there. I think perhaps... Uh, for the folks who are not convinced about the whole idea of separation or independence, whatever terminology that they find that suits them best, it's perhaps, it, the, the, you know, there's two sides to, to the way an exchequer works normally. Uh, that is, there's the whole business of spending money. How do you decide who gets the money and stuff like that? But the other part of it, uh, and I would argue almost as important, if not more so, is how do you raise the money? And, uh, and uh, whether you espouse um, modern monetary theory or not, the fact of the matter is that taxes have people generally get, get taxed. Uh, none of that happens in Scotland to any great degree. Uh, and that's where tough decisions really have to take place. And maybe some of the reservations that people have who are um, undecided, let's put it that way, is, you know, what confidence they have in politicians making the right decisions about whom to tax and how to tax them and how much to tax them. Now, it's frankly, it's difficult to do that if you don't have your hands on the levers of power, i.e. when you're actually making those decisions. But it does make the government a bit lopsided, you know, financially, because it's spending, but it's not, it's not actually earning in that particular sense. It gets a, it gets a, a grant and it, it uses the grant, as we know. Other questions we've got coming in. First of all, Anita King says she saw you at Bannockburn. Uh, you yes. know Anita? Okay. Uh, uh, Fiona Graham is asking, how do we get yesers to support independent media and stop sharing stuff from the mainstream media? We need to get better at what we do. We need to put out better content. We need to be more proactive working with each other. It's, it kind of boils down to you know, just getting everyone singing from the same hymn sheet. You know, it's getting different groups. And listen, there's a lot that have come out recently. We've, we're seeing now Scotland um, that have, have formed. Um, there's Action for Independence, uh, ISP. Yeah. We've got the National Newspaper as well. Um, so it's trying to get everyone around the, the, the table and having that, that kind of civilised conversation and, and making as much pro indie content as possible. It's one of the things that, when I do the, the live streams, when I first started doing them back, I think it was 2017, it was all about trying to get that message out there to people that were within my social media bubble. And it's the way that things like Facebook work. I post something on my page, there'll be 20 to 40 to 60 people that will see it. The more people that react to that, that comment, that like, that share, that will get spread into more bubbles. And the division, you know, because, you know, I've, I've got friends that are unionists. I've got friends that don't uh, agree with the SNP. I've got friends that, will, you know, that are conservatives. Um, but it doesn't mean to say that they're going to cut me out of their lives because 
I actually had a different view to them. It's about having that common conversation. Um, what we need to try and do is, yeah, get more get more positive content out there, have more challenging conversations. Um, I know Independence Live really sort of put on the In Defence for Scotland. Um, so there's, you know, the, so there's there's people, for example, you know, ex-military that you would think would be indoctrinated into unionism and British empirism, but they understand that, you know, for their children and grandchildren, that to have the decision-making powers lie within Scotland is in the best interest of everyone. That's where we really take back control and make a country that, that, that suits everybody. Yeah. Here's a question from Kenny Lowe. It's sort of technical, but you might come up with the answer here. Uh, if you're, he's asking, if your local yes group is, isn't doing terribly much, what do you do? Start your own, you know, um, create your own wee group, create, do your own things. It's um, one of the pages that I kind of just started recently that I'm kind of working on and, the, the, you know, for content for is Ask About I. And the kind of one of the, the ideas that I've got behind that is to, you know, go out wearing some sort of yes memorably, it be a, a yes t-shirt. Um, yes badge, yeah, you know, some sort of stuff. And, you know, be open to people coming up to you. Run your own yes stall, do your own yes bridge, pick a local bridge that's in your area and go and stand over it with a, a salt car for a couple of hours on a Saturday afternoon. Um, and you no doubt and get involved with like-minded people. Uh, that's, that's how I've got about it. I've got involved with lots of different groups and it's just about showing face. It's about getting there, meeting people, getting involved in the, the conversation and doing things online as well. Like, you know, asking a question on Facebook and seeing how the reactions go. Um, it's, it's, there's, there's, there's a hundred ways to skin a cat, you know. It's only getting covers out there, but there's there's all sorts of different things that we can be doing, you know, be it the people are, are painting their yes stones and leaving them in parks for the Wains to find, for their, to go up and ask their parents what's this about. Um when it comes to things like stickering everywhere, I'm, I'm not much of a fan of that. I don't like, you know, seeing the stickers plastered over everywhere. That's a, a bit more down the vandalism route. But it's, it's maybe a question that we, you know, when you look back, you have to flash back to 2014, and that whole campaign was ultimately a positive one. Although we didn't win it, we didn't have any violence. We didn't have any, you know, destruction of property or, you know, God forbid, people being killed. Yeah. Um, so. But, you know, to we get to a point of, you know, civil disobedience, you know, turning around and saying we've, we've had enough, you know, be that we refuse to give our taxes to Westminster, we refuse to put our money into pro-union businesses. Um, you know, it's, you know, the consumer can make a massive change. You know, let's look at some of the, the protests that have happened over the, the products that come out of Israel because of their um, situation, with, I don't want to say, Palestine too much on here because it will get shut down. That's <laughs> the the way Facebook goes nowadays. You start talking about things that are too controversial and they'll, they'll just silence you. Mm. So yeah, it's a case of getting out there, um, organising yes stalls at the, the marches and events. Um, there's just there's lots of different ways about it. I mean, I, I think I can say and some people have, and I, I, I'm going to take another question from Stephen here. It's, well, it's more of a statement uh, and you might want to comment on it. He's saying, why don't our MPs uh, hold stalls in every village, town and city in Scotland every weekend and hand out leaflets? Uh, they just seem as if they're not interested. Um, I, I know locally, I mean, my local M MSP is Jim Fairley, uh, and I wouldn't have thought that represented his approach. He's pretty active, um, particularly with the farming community. And it's, uh, I think if anyone's going to appeal to soft no, voters, it's going to be somebody like Jim Fairley, who's plugged into the farming community, who is, you know, is known around the place, uh, likes to be seen around the place, and, and can eloquently argue the case. Uh, of course, the challenge is getting these sort of people onto some sort of mass, uh, into some sort of mass audience, which is always, which is always going to be the case. Uh, by the way, I'm glad you mentioned uh, the uh, the program, the Independence Live program. Let me give it another plug. Uh, it was an online conference about defence and an independent Scotland. And if you haven't seen it, I'm sure there'll be it's available uh, and, and recording somewhere. 
do, do go and take a look at it because Indie Live uh, has a, a position that will be taking, it will be doing more of these shows. And effectively, it's almost a unique way of finding out about the big issues, economics, defense, all the things that people might ask you on the doorstep. The very things, for example, where you will never get this information from the mainstream media. And, it, and it's right in your home and it's free and it's right there for you. So the, the people behind this are doing a fantastic job. That's the end of the plug, but uh, we, we could always return to that if, uh, if there's some more questions about it. Uh, uh, that we've had, <laughs> I don't know what, what's happening tonight, uh, but two people have now asked who you're supporting tonight in the match. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not anti-English. Um, I'm anti-Westminster through the Baboon. Uh, but as a Ranger supporter, uh, I sat one time beside uh, Peter Lovencrantz on a plane from uh, Scotland to uh, Northern Ireland when they, uh, in fact, sorry, Republic of Ireland when they, uh, Denmark were playing there. So, yeah, I've got a wee soft spot for their uh, Germany town from East Coast Pride is twinned with Ballard up. Um, I did see a funny post on Facebook that it's uh, replaced the uh, Scotland in the map with uh, North um, Copenhagen. Copenhagen, aye. North Copenhagen <laughs> and Wales would be the place for South Copenhagen. Um, but that's, that's just football banter rivalry. You know, at the end of the day, it's a tough, heartbroken the way Scotland performed at, at the Euros. I thought, especially with the Hamden home advantage, we might have taken a few points there and made a better show of ourselves. But we drew with England. We, you know, the, we're the only team in so far in the competition that hasn't been beaten by England. So, yeah, we'll, we'll see how things pan out for them. But uh, I don't know if I could cope with them winning a tournament, you know, having 1966 played over for the next 60 years again. You know, it's... Uh, but no, listen, best of luck for them. It's, it, today's just a game. But there's a counter-argument that says you should welcome that because it will, uh, by upsetting lots of people, uh, it will give people more incentive to plug into the whole independence discussion. Possibly. I mean, it's one of the things that I've always found quite strange that, you know, that the St George Cross only seems to come out um, when England are playing football or at one of these uh, BMP marches or rallies. It's, it's about taking a bit of national pride. I, I don't understand why English people don't more associate with being English. Um, it's not something you tend to see up here. You know, the Scotland people, even if they, they're, they're pro-union, they identify Scottish first and foremost. Yeah. So it's, it's a strange one. Well, it, 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 it's part of that larger picture, which uh, Elliot Bulmer has um, analysed several times in the Sunday National. That, that unlike Scotland, there isn't a sort of focus on being English if you live in England. It, it only ever happens with football teams. And even then, it's sort of, it, it's very odd because it turns people into 90-minute patriots. Uh, and the rest of the time, it goes back to being sort of, who the heck are we then? And what's our place in the world? And I think a lot of the opposition, that's the sort of thinking opposition anyway, south of the border to independence, is probably stems from that sense of unease. In other words, if you go, what, what, what does that make us? And I really don't want you to go because I don't want to have that discussion. So yeah. it's, not, it's not so much a sort of anti-Scottish, you know, but rather, this is too difficult. I, I just don't, you know. And you guys seem very happy doing this stuff. You're very happy looking at where you are in the world and talking to other people about how you are in the world. Uh, I think a lot of people said they're going to find that a little bit sort of awkward because it means you have to lower your defences in order to have a meaningful conversation about how people see you. And they may turn around and say, I don't think a lot of you. And, and for Scots, they can take that, it seems to me, a lot of the time. Um, I, I think it's very difficult if you haven't been used to that. I, I think in Scotland there's been a long tradition of being used to somebody saying, oh, I, th I think you're too poor and too wee and too stupid. Uh, so, you know, there's not that, there's not that defensive mechanism <laughs> in some countries about, well, who are you to criticise me? Rather than say, okay, let's look at these issues and see if we can, uh, see if we can talk some more about them, perhaps. Um, I mean, it's, it's one of the things that, because I you know, went into when they 
Alex Salmon first announced uh, the referendum in 2012, I did go into it with an open mind and thought, you know, I was leaning on the independent side, but I thought, let's hear the arguments, let's see what the, the politicians are saying, what different groups come up with. Um, and I think one thing that always stands out for me was there was not a single English MP that came out and said, yes, yeah, Scotland, you are a financial burden to us, now's the time to go, now's the time to leave. Um, they, they were all for it, they were all for the, the union staying intact. So if we were such a financial burden, why wouldn't they take the opportunity to cut us loose? The simple reason is we're the cash cow. You know, Scotland is a massive net producer when it comes to global exports with the salmon, whiskey, gin industry. Uh, there's the oil and gas sector. There's the tourism sector. There, there's, we have, and it's one of, you know, 2014, we were getting compared a lot of time to countries like Greece and Spain and Portugal that were going through a horrendous time. But they were, their economies are very different. Scotland's, their economies are very much based on tourism. And we're obviously at that point coming out of the back of the, the 2008 financial crisis. So consumer spending was right down, which meant people weren't going abroad and weren't spending the money on holidays. You know, yeah. whereas Scotland is much, much more diverse than that. You know, we, we, we have the some of the best universities in the world here. You know, you just have to look at the history books and see some of the things that the Scots have created and contributed. Um, can't remember who it was that said it, but someone compared the you know, when you talk about modern politics, other than the Greeks, it's the Scots that have contributed most to it. You know, a Scot that created the, 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 the British Labour Party that, you know, resulted in the formation of things like the NHS. And, sure. you know, we, I think, I think we've got was, a lot to offer the world. I think it was Winston Churchill, uh, an unlikely source for that. <laughs> I know, and you know, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> you could get a completely different conversation about who was worse, Winston Churchill or Hitler. In <laughs> It was all that done the concentration camps first. You know, it was, um, you know, you look at the famines. Well, in Phyllis and Churchill, he didn't start the concentration camps, but uh, they, they were used during the Boer War, there's no question, uh, and, uh, which is very regrettable, of course. Uh, look, looking at this, this sort of larger point here, Ian, uh, you, there's a question here that says, uh, how, how do you see things working out for the independence movement? Not so much in terms of cooperation, and, all, and all, uh, which is important, and you've covered that very well. Uh, but uh, Kenny Lowe, for example, is saying, what's your vision? Or what's the vision for an independent Scotland? I think we all have different ideas. Um, one of the things that I would, you know, if I was to pick out top three priorities, we need to have a universal basic income. Uh, we need to change the way that we, we do things with regard to disability benefits, with regard to pensions, with regard to um, carers allowances. If everybody was on a universal basic income, which is something that's probably going to be needed, it was um, Elon Musk that was talking about it quite recently. Um, because automization is happening across the globe. You know, you, you, you mentioned the farming sector earlier on, you know, a farm, 50, 100, 150 years ago is very different to how it operates today. You know, there's a one machine will do the job of what would have been the job of 30, 40, 50 people at, at a yeah. time. Um, you look at things with the automization of, you know, the you know food shops. You go into any of the, 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 the high street supermarkets nowadays and you've got automated tills everywhere. So, yeah. you know, and things, you know, Trucks, cars, in the next 15, 25 years, they're all going to be self-driving. So there's going to be, a, you know, there's just going to be less and less jobs as we go forward and forward. So having a tax and businesses properly, I mean, you, you look at uh, companies like Google, Amazon, Facebook, the amount of they avoid paying in tax through different loopholes by, you know, we don't make a profit in this country, even though we've had sales in the trillions. You know, these, these things need to change. We need to take accountability for business. Businesses need to be supported um, and given room to grow, but it needs to be done in a, a fair and balanced manner. Um, I flash back to, I think it was at the, the Motorola company. They had factories in um, East Kilbride. I think there was one over Livingston as well. Um, and they received massive government grants to build up these sectors, do their, their research and development industries. 
and they just simply moved the jobs out of the, the UK because it became, you know, not cost effective for them. Um, so there should be you know, instruments that because the, yeah, the fact that they need things. I think that's maybe <clears throat> part of a larger debate because, I mean, I, I, I've advised lots of businesses and I've been in a whole bunch of boardrooms over the years. Uh, and it, it, for me, it seemed that the problems, we are, we are the problem, I'm afraid. Uh, it's too easy to slough it off onto business because they're doing what we ask them to do, which is a very odd thing to say. But as long as company law enshrines the need for a company, first and foremost, to make a profit, uh, it, it, it legitimizes it, pretty much any method within the law uh, uh, for, the, for the company to do that. And, uh, and, and why, do we, why do we say that? We, 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 say, we, we say it because our, our pension funds, our insurance policies, are, are, to some degree invested in those corporations. So if they were to not do so well, uh, i.e. take decisions that were uh, perhaps in the public interest, but not in terms of making uh, uh, better returns, then you do have the awkward situation that uh, our pensions and our insurance would, would probably be affected. So, I mean, it, is, it seems to me that we've really got to take a look at this bigger picture, uh, which is, Maybe something uh, the Scottish government ought, ought, ought to be looking at. I know there was a growth commission, uh, but it seems to me that didn't quite look at that. How would company law be amended in Scotland? And you have to be very careful too, uh, because you can have your own law, and all that might do in effect is to persuade uh, companies to decamp to other jurisdictions where they're able to operate more freely. So yeah, you need international agreements, really. Uh, well, I'm not. That, I'm not sure the EU did a stand-up job in some of this stuff, but at least it was an attempt, uh, you know, for a range of governments to exercise some control o o o o over what over corporate behaviour. But I think we have to do much. That more. would that would be one of the second things that I would change in an independent Scotland as well. I would not nationalise every single industry. But I would put a national body in every single industry. So, for example, you mentioned there the insurance providers. There's not a government-backed insurance scheme. So we'd have a, we should have a national insurance company. We should have a national telecoms operator. We should have a national railway provider. And if you put a national body in every single sector, then you've always got a baseline that keeps the whole market in check. You've got, potentially, if you're looking at, for example, you know, a, a government-run broadband provider. That way, every citizen in the country can get access to internet. And then it's then down to private enterprise to come in with alternative options to provide a superior service. And that's where you, you, you continue that competition with. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there needs, you know, a nationalised banking sector as well. And it's something that Scotland really needs, you know. We don't want to run off of the Bank of England's monetization policy. We're going to have to have a, a national bank to run the, the baseline of the economy. But yeah, I think it's important that, you know, that talk about job creation. You know, where I'm from in East Kilbride, I, I mentioned the Motorola factory closed down. There was also the, the Rolls Royce factory that initially moved production from East Kilbride down to somewhere in England. And now they've moved production from somewhere in England over to, I think it's uh, Holland they've gone to uh, because of the, the, the Brexit factor. So. There's all these different jobs that are being taken out. You know, East Kilbride, one of the things that's happening here locally is they're, they're upgrading the railway line from East Kilbride into Glasgow. Um, so they'll be trains running every 15 minutes rather than every 30. But one of the main reasons for that is because the Centre One Tax Office is due to close in the next few years. So and they need to improve the public transport system to get people from this town into Glasgow city centre. So there's another three, 4,000 jobs that will be going from the town. So there's just... We need to have real the government working at a grassroots level with entrepreneurs, different business sectors, looking at ways that we can bring more people into work. Or even if it's a case of, you know, having a universal basic income, you can put yeah. people to work in their communities. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I've, my experience of countries elsewhere that didn't go through the so-called Thatcher period is that they still spend substantial sums on uh, people upkeeping 
local communities. You know, the, the pla these places tend to be cleaner. There tends to be less dog beds. There tends to be less litter because it's somebody's job to go around at seven, eight o'clock, nine o'clock at night and clear up. Now, uh, Thatcher got rid of all of that because she said, look, the, the, the economy ought to be run like a private household, which was nonsense on stilts. Uh, but a whole bunch of people picked that up and ran with it. And the result was that the, the local authority budgets were cut and we have what we have now, which is, uh, you know, it's like an ill-fitting suit. It, it fits with it, touches. And some authorities do a good job and others do a terrible job, not because necessarily they're ill-equipped, it's just that they're ill-funded. Um, uh, so, uh, and it, I, I can't honestly, with short of independence, see that ever being uh, rectified, it seems to me. I mean, it's, it, it, there's, no, there's no debate about that happening elsewhere. It's, it's active in Scotland. And I think a universal basic income, uh, I, I can understand why the, the present UK government isn't hugely interested because it would put pain to the Conservative Party forever. <laughs> if everyone got basic income, where's your control over the population? Because the whole control is exercised by either preventing a job or withdrawing, withholding a job. That's the way things are. And the other thing I would suggest it maybe ought to be looked at is some help for people who are starting up their own businesses. Because I suspect the future will be very different to the so-called normality we've been accustomed to. I think there'll be many, many more people who, for a whole raft of reasons, and I think COVID might accelerate this, I've decided I'm going to do my own thing here. All I need is a bit of help, to, to, to just a little bit of stimulus to get me going, because I've got this fantastic idea. And if you look at Scots throughout the world, I mean, you know, all these inventions and all that good stuff, uh, there's obviously something in the water. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know what? It's, it's, since I got back from working in Europe, it, it's something I've been trying to work on as well, farm loan business. Um, and I've got to, you know, credit where credit's due, the, the, the Scottish government's um, Scottish enterprise um, offered phenomenal support, lots of yeah. advice and different programmes to get people started up. When it comes to things like funding, it's it's null and void. <laughs> you know, you, there's, there's not that same level of support. Um, and that's really where you're then looking into private enterprise. When the problem with my business ultimately is it's a, looking at Scottish exports. So until Brexit sorted out, it's a, it's a no starter. Um, because at the moment, you know, you've got you know companies that have been trading for hundreds of years um, that can navigate their way around the the, the different oh. legislations that are going out in place, and it's it's just an absolute minefield. Um, you know, it's. It, we're starting to, see, and you'll notice it more and more. The, 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 the produce in this country is starting to run out. We're starting to see shortages in lorry drivers. Um, we're seeing, I think it was one of the food stores that started putting up pictures of fresh produce in there instead of fresh produce <laughs> in the boxes to make it fill out the shelves a wee bit. But whereas, you know, you go back to, you know, before the, the whole COVID and Brexit scenario, you could go to a shop and you could have a choice of, Eight or nine different pastas, and you know that choice is now down to one or two. You know, it's it's the the product selection has been really reduced, and that's all, just all been hampered by people going. It's not worth it. It's not worth the hassle of importing into the UK. The, you know, the, the building industry is struggling to get bricks and sand because of the import duties and yeah. the, all the legislative paperwork. So it's and it's, we're only going to really see the, the true effects of this as we come out of all these restrictions and as the economy starts to get back to some sort of normality that people are going to start to realize that you know that things have changed drastically and it, it's one of the things that you know on the people's doorstep referendum podcast show that we were doing for years but give them a wee shout they're going live in 15 minutes with their international chat the show as well later on um but what we always talked about was having you know the independent referendum before breaks was done and dusted because we needed to, we, I just, I think the whole question about Scottish independence and being in the EU has to be a separate question. It has to be treated as a separate entity. Um, but it is very important that we have a positive relationship with Europe because if we don't, it's just, it's not going to work out for anyone. You know, it's, it's not going to work out for businesses that rely on international labour. It's not going to work out for businesses that rely on supply and demand of their products. It's not going to rely on us as end consumers because it's at the end of the day we'll be covering our own pockets. We'll be as it'll be paying more for the 
the different things that we want to buy. Yeah, I, I, my own sense of it remains that I, I suspect the new industries will be predicated less upon supply and demand of, of uh, tangible products, but more intangible. I, um, I, I think the web-based systems will uh, proliferate and they'll go in many different directions um, if the research is, is accurate. Uh, let's take a, a few more uh, questions here. Angela Leach is asking this, any ideas on how to attract young soft nose? under 30 age who don't like boring stats and politics in general. Digital, me digital media would be obvious, but content, ideas? Well, something I tried doing a while ago was um, playing video games. Um, it was one of the games played at the time was Fortnite. And, you know, you, for Fortnite, you can do squad games where you get four people in a lobby. So my kind of concept was let's get four people in, let's get, you know, a professional gamer, an interviewer and someone that's pro union and someone that's pro independence and yeah. put them in a squad game together and see if they can win. I tried that a couple of times and uh, the response I got was, What's this stupid video game doing on this pro independence page? It was <laughs> so I, it was, um, yeah, that didn't go, that went down like an absolute wide point. There's all sorts of different ways that you reach out to the young people. I think, as I said, if you're doing different things like street stalls, um, if you're you know, having, if, if you're different, you know, we, we put a lot of focus on doing marches and rallies. Why don't we have yes to folks? Why don't we have, you know, yes, music festivals? Why don't we have yes, sporting events? Um, yeah. Getting partnerships in place with different organisations to, you know, support, you know, young football teams or support uh, other grassroots sports and, you know, rugby, whatever, it, you know, golf, snow sports. Um, there's all sorts of different things that we can do, but I think the problem, especially back post 2014, because yes was behind the whole way through the polls, um, businesses didn't want to alienate more than half of their customer base by going into one side or the other. Um, now that that balance has shifted, you know, the, the last 20 odd pro independence, uh, pro Scottish referendum polls have come out in favour of another independence referendum and being in, in favour of Scottish independence. So now's the time for businesses to look at that, supporting their yes groups, you know, like because at the end of the day, it's, it's those same marchers and walkers that, that will be coming and putting in money in their tills. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's there's lots of different things we could all be doing together. But, it's, yeah, it's just a case of trying to get our heads down and get on with the day job. Well, and maybe there'll be a multiplier effect. Maybe the work that you're doing and the work that, Kevin Gibney and others are doing may well stimulate other people and excite them and want that make them want to get involved. I mean, I know Kevin is consistently saying to people, and I would say this to everyone watching and listening tonight, if you want to have your own show like this one on uh, Indie Live, get in touch with Kevin. Go to the What's On Guide. There's all sorts of ways to get in touch with him and say, look, I would like to have my own show. Now, I mean, I'm not suggesting... <laughs> that Kevin has loads of spare time here, but he'll find a way, I can guarantee you, to help you uh, if, that's, if that's what you wish to do. Oh, by the way, I should mention, you talked about uh, doing something with unionists and, and others on the same programme. We've got something exciting coming up in the next two weeks I need to tell you about right now in that context. Next week, we have the SNP president, Michael Russell on the show, and the week after, we have Times journalist Hugo Rifkin. Now, Hugo is not in favour of independence. Uh, but as you know, if you watch this show and listen to it, we cover the waterfront here. We don't, we're not stuck in silos. We don't only talk to people in one particular. So very much looking forward to uh, hearing uh, from Hugo. And he's dead keen to come on the programme, which is fantastic. And uh, it's a great tribute to him. So uh, that, that, that's the plug over and done with. Uh, Fiona Graham is saying well, land reform surely is desperately needed. Yeah, it's um, well, we're doing the walk where we're going through lots of different areas that were owned by different wards and all sorts. And to be honest with you, when you're speaking to some of those communities, a lot of them were quite pro what had been done, you know, with the lands. But yeah, 
especially it was, I think they, when we were walking on the Isle of Sky, one of the things I noticed there, there was plots of land for sale everywhere. Um, so I, I don't know if it should be a case of an automatic buyback, if there should be tax levied on it. It's about taking control over the, the, the land that's ours. Um, I know that the royals get a, lots of tax breaks for all their royal estates up in this country as well. So there's there's lots of different ways that we need to look at, you know, who actually owns Scotland. And, you know, at the end of the day, when it comes to, it should be the people of Scotland that own the natural assets. So the amount of money, you know, talk about the economy, the forestation across Scotland is absolutely massive. You know, the, one of the things that the SNP talk about is the number of trees that they get planted every year. The problem is those trees that they're planting aren't for environmental purposes or for industrial purposes. It's for, you know, short-term timber growth. So there's lots of different projects we can do that, you know, restoring natural woodland and reintroducing, you know, green belt, proper green belt areas. Um, you know, having a national network of walkways and cycleways and horse paths. So, that, you know, one of the things that I found when we were going from town to town, which we're often walking along the roadside, and it was unless you were a, a local, there was no alternative route. Um, and a lot of the paths outside the central belt, they're non-existent. So you're literally walking along the curb, and it's you know people are having to you know take their because they're taking their own life in their hands every time yeah. they walk out the front door to go to a neighbour. So yeah, we really need to look at how the country is designed, how it works for the people here, because it's. We put a lot of focus on to what happens here in Glasgow and Edinburgh and across the central belt, but there's so, so many people out with those areas that really need proper support in how their day-to-day lives are operating. So here we are in a situation where you've clearly identified a whole range of needs. Well, by the way, we should make it plain when you talk about your your walk, in fact, that uh, uh, how far did you walk and how many days? So... We went from the 18th of September uh, 2020 to the 30th of November. So we're on the road for 74 days. I was doing daily ND Live vlogs. So as you said, if you go back through the, the ND Live archive there, you'll be able to see all the, the different daily vlogs from all the, the towns that I had a really good habit of mispronouncing as I went through them. Um, but I think at the end, I was, I'd was i signed up for 500 miles um, and changed from the 500 route to the 1320 route to the then onto the 700 route. So I ended up clocking 1140 miles over that Ooh, 74 boy. days. So ah, it was a bit of a trek, but it was um, it was a good opportunity to go out and see the country, see how things were working. And yeah, it, what a phenomenal experience meeting different people from all sorts of places. They, as I said, the local yes groups, you know, up at, you know, up at the WIC, Furso, um, just everywhere. The, the, all these wee places really came out to cheer us on and walk alongside us for a few miles or for a day and it was it was a really good outreach programme it was all to promote the, the Scottish Digital Covenant uh, which is still active still live, uh, pop on to www.digitalcovenant.scot you can sign up to that and that's really, effectively we talk about Plan A, B, C to independence that could very much become a plan A to how Scotland operates um, you know with a blockchain democracy and, and true people power you know put a uh, Decision making into local communities, local individuals that, that know best what to do where they are. You know, yeah, I, think, I don't. You know, I think I think that yeah, I think you've you've hit the nub of the problem there. Is uh, having travelled in lots of other countries, and, uh, and maybe you've found this as well. Uh, uh, there's a certain lack of empowerment felt by people in Scotland. They they feel that. Uh, things I've done to them rather than thing, them doing things. I'm, I'm, I'm generalising now, of course, and, and please forgive me, but there is that sense of it compared to other countries where people do feel empowered. And it's not just the sort of trivial stuff where the United States, people like their own dog catcher as well as the sheriff and all the rest of it. It's the fact that the people feel, I can do this. I, 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 I can do, this is something I can do and when we looked at it, uh, we did some research, it seemed to be the case that it's based on the fact that the people there felt they were sovereign. They felt that the individual decided the state, not the state deciding what was good for the individual. 
And I think yeah. we've had all these hundreds of years where it's worked the other way around, i.e. the state tells you what to do instead of you telling the state what to do, i.e. the state is your servant. And because unless you have that sense of the individual being sovereign, you do end up, it seems to me, I'm afraid, with a situation that people are reconciled to the state doing things to them. Yeah, it, it kind of reminds me a bit about the, um, you might know about it, the, the Kaizen business model, which kind of originated from Japan. And you think about a business structure as a pyramid where you've got your CEO at the mm-hmm. top, your directors, line managers, and, and the workers at the bottom. You take that pyramid and flip it upside down. And you, you know, talk about, you know, in a Scotland aspect, you've got the first minister, her cabinet, MPs, council leaders, citizens all the way down. If you flip that pyramid upside down and put the most important people at the top being the people, they can then actually filter down all the information to say, this is what's wrong here. This is what's wrong with my roads. This is what's wrong with my local school. This is what's wrong with my bin collections. This is what, you know, is, is wrong with the youth here. Um, because, you know, if after 10 years of Tory-led austerity, that there's, there's not the funds there for, you know, grassroots groups. Um, there's, there's, we really need to rethink how Scotland works and we need to make it work for everybody um, and even in the event of independence there's going to be people that are going to remain you know pro-unionist it's about working with those individuals to go this is how the lay of the laws of the land are now what do you want to see happen what changes do you want to happen to your community what what can we improve here um, and I think something like a blockchain democracy would enable that it would allow things to get done on a postcode basis so you get a wee ping on your phone to say this is happening in your local area within your, your bubble. You know, do you want to get involved with it? Do you want to make a decision on it? And it's one of the problems for the, the Scottish government as well. The fact that Holyrood isn't held accountable to anyone other than Westminster. Um, there's no second chamber to discuss, you know, what 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 happens, what, what laws are getting decided on. So we need to look at those kind of things. You know, how do we well, not I, just I hold think that's my point. The election? I, I think one of the first things I would have done had I if I was in power for 12 years, would have been to address that very point, which is to say, uh, in future, uh, we are not going to be a carbon copy of Westminster. We're going to invest power in the people and we're going to draft a constitution in which that is enshrined. And uh, for the life of me, I cannot understand why that wasn't done. Because I think once you do that, you actually, by the dint of doing it, you, you empower people because you acknowledge right from the get-go that the individual is the person who has the sovereignty. And they decide on the base of that sovereignty to give a little bit of it to politicians in order to carry out certain duties that they themselves either can't do or won't do or or feel like somebody else ought to do. That seems to be a grown-up relationship, i.e. that the individual decides. Uh, And uh, obviously, most of the decisions have to be based on a community-wide basis, not to achieve anything, frankly. Uh, But that's up to the politicians to work that out, it seems to me. Hey, we've almost run out of time. Uh, (laughs) This happens every single week, Ian, uh, by the time we go through the questions and stuff. Um, A big thank you to you uh, for joining us uh, this evening. I think it's been enlightening. I also feel that, frankly, uh, uh, you've dealt with all the questions so eloquently but I suspect in some ways we've only sort of scratched the surface, really, because, you know, it would take two or three hours to cover most of this stuff in the detail that it deserves, quite frankly. But there we are. We've pretty much run out of time. A big thank you to Ian. A big thank you to everyone watching and listening tonight. And thank you again for your questions. We've had masses and masses. Uh, uh, and of course, please look out for my column. Uh, and the Sunday National, uh, so the Constitution column in the seven-day supplement at the back of the, the back of the supplement, which is inside the newspaper itself. And uh, we'll be talking about nocebos, nocebos, yeah. A nocebo is the opposite of a placebo. <laughs> Read the column, you'll know all about it after that. I'm suggesting that we're, we're being run on a, a nocebo basis. Support in your life, as always, please, because it's terribly important. And if you like the TNT and show if there's an Independence Live fundraiser, go there and use that, please. Thank you again. Uh, it's been great. As I mentioned earlier, we've got SNP President 
Mike Russell coming up next week. So get your questions in for him. And the week after, we have Times journalist Hugo Rifkin. All free, no license, no problem. Straight to your home, taking your questions live on air. Can anyone else say that? Can the BBC say that? No way. But we do it and we deliver it every week with talented people like Ian here. Thank you for watching and thank you, Ian. Good night, everyone. Good night.